and welcome and thank you for stopping by today as you know uh, it's been in the news lately that the city of Danbury has experienced a uh, increase uptick if you will in uh, our COVID-19 numbers there have been steps that have been taken by the city uh, not limited to but uh, that are included things like uh, delaying our entrance into the school system that'll take place on September 8th on a distance learning uh, scenario which later on we hope to be able to move to a hybrid and then eventually full school uh, we have also taken other steps here in the city which include but are not limited to closing down all of our fields uh, in addition to that our boat launch is closed uh, deep will be closing the Latin's Cove boat launch if it's not already closed it will be closed shortly I want to thank the governor and his team for for helping that happen um, and look the, I, we're doing these things because uh, we want to make sure that we protect our residents all of us uh, that are standing here the elected officials have taken oath to protect the health, safety, and welfare of every person in this city and in the greater Danbury area. So these steps that are we taking are measured, they're reasonable, they're rational, uh, and it's because we're concerned. Uh, we can pull back on them, and we certainly intend to pull back on them as fast as possible. We know people have got COVID fatigue, we get it, but at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that our folks are healthy. So I'm going to bring up our, direct, our acting director of public health, Kara Prunty, for a minute to give us kind of an overview of what the numbers look like, where we are in terms of that. Uh, later on, uh, then she'll, uh, we'll bring up the governor for some remarks, and we again want to thank him for his assistance, and then um, bring up some folks from New Vance Danbury Hospital, and then we'll certainly open up to some questions. And yep, <laughs> and uh, David Arcani is also here. We have our state legislators here. We appreciate it. David Arcani is with us. Uh, Rahib Ali Brennan is with us. Ken Gucker is here with us, and Bob Godfrey is here as well. And we thank them and honor them for being here. I've got a call. It's probably not important. So with that, uh, Kara, if you can come up and kind of give us a briefing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're here today just to, again, raise awareness. We are seeing an uptick in our cases. Uh, right now, our rolling average is uh, 22 cases per 100,000. Uh, we are working very closely with the state. We have their support. Uh, our community partners, our federally qualified health centers to get the message out, to go out, get tested, stay home, wait for your results, and participate with our contact tracers. If we have cooperation from everyone, then I believe that we can work together to stop the spread. We're really reminding everyone to, if they are feeling ill, to isolate from their family members as much as they can in their homes and take all the precautions. Um, we are seeing a lot of spread with, among small family gatherings. Um, we're trying to ask people to, um, to stay socially distant if they are going to have a family gathering and to limit the amount of, of togetherness that we have. Um, we are also joined here with uh, Sharon Adams, the president of Danbury Hospital and New Milford Hospital. So if Sharon wants to give an update, Sharon. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'll give you a little update just of the hospital, how we're doing. Uh, in the last month, actually, we uh, are proud to say we've done extremely well, and I'm thankful to uh, the city and the state uh, with all the regulations and all the community support and all of you uh, abiding by our social distancing and wearing masks. We have really seen our numbers go to all-time low. We have seen a slight uptick in the last week, week and a half, but still seen our numbers low and are partnering with our community uh, members, our mayor, our teams, our Department of Public Health to really work with helping our outreach, community testing. But I uh, feel that, you know, if you remember correctly, it was our state and our hospital that had the first patient, uh, the first employee, and had significant numbers. We've had over 700 patients go through Danbury Hospital. We've uh, tested over 42,000 outpatient testers. So we did this all together as a community, working together. Uh, and uh, we see this uh, little uptick as something that we can just continue to work together as and do not see it as something that we cannot conquer easily and continue to work together on and continue to have our lives. All we need to do is to remember to social distance wear our masks, and definitely use your community testing if you need to, and thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to um, publicly thank uh, Governor Lamont for making all of the resources available of the state of Connecticut available to us. We were on the phone 
all weekend long, uh, addressing some of the concerns that we've had. Um, one of the deepest concerns I think that we both share is that uh, we see some of the spread going on amongst our children, and that's concerning uh, to parents, to grandparents, to loved ones. We want to make sure that we can uh, slow the spread, and we really only have about a week and a half to do that. Once a week and a half goes by, if you haven't taken the right steps, if you haven't done the right things, it can be a runaway freight train, and that's why we're here today. We want everybody to get tested. We're offering testing today, uh, right now, at Rogers Park Middle School till 2 p.m., and then again starting at 4.30 p.m., and we've had almost a 1,000 people that have been tested over the last two days, so Danbury residents, go out there. You don't need to be symptomatic. It's a free test. Uh, and that way we can find the levels of the spread and where it is and you, through our contact tracing be able to go back and be able to find out where folks picked up uh, the particular virus. With that, I want to call the governor up now for some remarks and once again just thank him for making all the resources available to the state. Governor? All right. Hey, well, thank you, Mark. And we were just standing there, remember, March 6th. It seems like yesterday when uh, at Danbury Hospital with the uh, very first infection was... Uh, right here, not that long ago. Remember we used to think Wuhan is a long way away, and then it was Seattle, and then it was New Rochelle, and then it was Connecticut, and uh, that was here. A lot has gone on since then. Uh, we, we had our surge, there's no question about it, and Danbury Hospital, a lot of our hospitals got close, but always uh, had capacity, you know, for which we're very thankful. And really over the last uh, few months, as we've cautiously reopened the state, our infection rate has consistently gone down. Uh, so we've really been one of the uh, lowest in the country, about 1% uh, over the last uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 days, for which we're really thankful. And that was really due to prevention because of everybody really following the protocol seriously, starting with a mask, keeping the social distancing. But there have been leaks. And it's a little ironic that here we are back in Danbury because um, we've had, uh, it's not a surge, but it's an uptick. And we're going to come down hard on upticks like this. We've had maybe 1% infection rate around uh, the state and maybe uh, 6 or 7% here in Danbury. And it happened uh, relatively quickly. And, uh, you know, Mayor, that's why we've come in hard. You know, thanks to your leadership here, we've come in hard. We've come in hard with testing in particular, testing and track and trace. We've tested hundreds of people in here. And i got to say, uh, everything I've heard from public health, is that the people of uh, Danbury have just been just great. They've come in, they've taken their test, they've waited um, in terms of those results. I did hear, um, look, we've got to do an even better job of getting those results faster. You know, we've got uh, most of the state now, we get the results back in a day or two. But imagine how many extra people you can talk to if it takes five days to get those results. We are going to prioritize Danbury in terms of making sure we get those uh, results back so we can track and trace, so we can limit the spread. You know, right now it's not spreading uh, beyond uh, the greater Dan, beyond Danbury to be more specific, for which we're really thankful, really thankful the community here taking the quarantining seriously uh, when we've got to do that. Uh, with one, I guess, a bit of an exception. You were telling me about some of the parties, um, maybe in Candlewood Lake. So we've had to uh, shut down the boat launch there. I think the mayor's done the same right now. Um, Chief of Staff was telling me, you know, it was getting sort of, you almost had the Uber of boats going back and forth to the island and maybe 100 plus kids out there. And again, we've seen a higher infection rate among young people. And just remember, young people, perhaps you don't suffer all the same complications that your parents or grandparents do, but you can uh, infect. And uh, I got to be very strict about this. The mayor's being incredibly strict about this, and we're going to hold people accountable and uh, you're not going to be going out for these uh, big parties uh, going forward. Look, um, it's going to be a bit of a journey, and it's not going to be a straight line. And uh, I think you know that um, nobody more than me wanted to get our schools open. I knew just how important that is for um, young people, especially the kids who have been social isolated for so long. But um, I think Dan Burry's doing the right thing. We're going to hold off hold off on um, in-person education uh, for at least till uh, October 1st, is that right? But we're gonna have a green light or we have a determination over the next few weeks. I know Western Connecticut as well had to slow that down. Look, the rest of the states at 1%, they're in a different situation. But when you have to change course, public health comes first. That's what we're doing in Danbury. And I just gotta say, um, 
to all the healthcare team that's here, um, you guys have been amazing. You were here at the very beginning when we were here. I'm pleased to see that you, I think you mentioned there may be four or five folks in the ICU maximum. We've got good capacity in our hospitals now. This is not a time to panic, but it is a time to be cautious. And remember, if we hit this hard here in Danbury, it doesn't spread beyond. We can continue to make good progress across the state. Thanks, everybody. I'd like to take a quick moment to recognize our emergency management team that's here with us. Matt Casavecchia from New Vance, who's incoming emergency management director, and TJ Weedle, who is our current emergency management director, who uh, is hanging on until I tell him he's done. So that's going to be a while. Um, we also have a great legislative delegation that's been very supportive, and I'm going to ask David Arcani, state representative from the Fighting 109th District, to come forward with a few thoughts. David? Thanks, everybody. And, you know, I'm really going to speak today as my role as House Chair of the Energy Committee as well. Um, Acting Director Kara Prunty gave us a, a great detailed um, update on where we're seeing the spikes here in Danbury and some of the reasons for it a little earlier. And there, there's a noticeable uptick in uh, infections with, it, within neighborhoods, within parts of our city, uh, that were without power for the longest. The areas of downtown in particular that were out of power for seven plus days um, during using the heat map uh, uh, capabilities that the health department has and tracking uh, has been noticed that that's where we're seeing uh, this uptake. And, you know, I, I think that's an important um, concept to get out there, an idea to get out there for you all, because, you know, as, as the Energy Committee is going to be doing our part um, to hold the utilities accountable for, for how they've pre-staged uh, the event, we're having our informational forum on Thursday. My co-chair and I, and the rest of the committee, along with the governor's team, are, are working on a pretty expansive piece of legislation uh, and that will hopefully be taken up in special session sometime in September, um, but I wanted to get that out there because I think it's important and you know, I'm going to be reaching out to the Department of Public Health uh, looking for statistics from other cities in the state where power was out for the longest uh, to see if any uptick in cases uh, happen there and see what we can do going forward. So I want to thank you for this and hand it back to the mayor. So uh, thank you, David. We appreciate that. Just put an exclamation point on that. Uh, when we lost power, uh, you can literally see on the map the spread expanding in those areas where there was not power for an extended period of time. With that, uh, that pretty much concludes, unless anybody else has anything to say. Um, and we certainly can take any questions. Somebody has any questions or concerns. But other than that, that will pretty much wrap it up. Yes, sir. I, I got this for the governor, but sure, you, you talked about losing power. There was nothing. I mean, we lost power across the state. I, I would pitch that to the governor, but I would say if you were a mayor or first selectman in a community that had an extended period of time without power and you had a high transmission rate like we had already had going on, yeah, I would check and work with your health department to do your contact tracing and to see if these cases have moved throughout the community. That's what we've seen here, and that's certainly something that we're going to be addressing. But, Governor, I don't know if you want to. No, we're going to follow that really closely. Um, you know, as David said, um, a lot of the outage here was in neighborhoods that are congested, often multi-generational housing, uh, congest, you know, people getting together to get that air conditioning. A lot of the outage around the state, you know, with trees down, more wooded area, more single family. So I think uh, Danbury was maybe hit a little disproportionately in that front. But, um, you know, as David said, we got to track that in all of our cities right now. This may be a canary in the coal mine. I think a couple of things. Uh, one, how fast uh, this tick up uh, went going forward. Uh, I think that was uh, incredibly important as we looked at this. Not just that it was 7%, but the positivity per 100,000 was beyond our um, you know, scale as well. Look, there's a little bit of a judgment on these things. It's not a, a, a black and white, but I think the scale, how fast it happened, 
or were two key considerations. And that same with schools as well. Give a little judgment to the superintendents there. No, I haven't heard that yet. I don't. Let me let me take a look at those numbers. I don't think they're anything uh, like what we're seeing here right now. And I'd like to think that things are flattening out because people are doing the right thing. We'll know in a few days, I hope. Governor, you mentioned yesterday that you're accelerating nursing home testing. How many folks in nursing homes have already been tested, and are you going to get those results back? Um, perhaps you can help me with this. I understand the nursing homes here in Danbury. We're going to test everybody at least on a weekly basis. And you you said there might be one small outbreak you want to talk about? Yes. So this, the state is implementing the testing policies that they had in, per in process when before when we were having um, the at the height of the outbreak or out of the height of the pandemic. Um, so they are testing all nursing homes at this point. So they're doing that weekly testing in all of our nursing homes. Uh, we are investigating an outbreak in one of our rehab facilities and we're working in conjunction with um, the state of state Department of Public Health to do that. Uh, so far it's four cases and it's all staff members. It's, it's all staff, staff, four staff and one patient. Um, I, I don't know if I can tell that information. I mean, you guys usually give out nursing homes. Nursing homes. Yeah, I will um, defer to the state DPH to give that information out at this time. And one patient, yes. It's an ongoing investigation. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, I do have a, I do have a follow up to that. I mean, when it comes to travel, you're equating some of this outbreak to national and international travel. Um, so, uh, are we still filling out that travel form? Are people still filling that out? And have there been any fines in this particular situation for people who haven't done The answer to that is yes. Um, Look, the, the Tri-State Consortium, now Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we still have in place our quarantine. I'd like to think that more of these states are going to fall off of that as their positivity rate gets below 10 percent. But CDC is doing their thing. It's really important that if people coming from a very highly infected state or a highly infected country by that um, same criterion, um, you quarantine. You test in quarantine. That is by far the safest thing we can do. We're doing that for all of our colleges. If you want to know where I have a little red flag in my head, it's less about K through five or K through eight education. It's a lot more about our colleges, where we are bringing in folks from all over the country and even all over the world. And the colleges have been very strict about testing before you're on that plane, testing when you get to college, and quarantining. Quarantining as best you can with a college student. Right now, I think we've done pretty well on that front. Have there been? No. Not as yet, no. Uh, Governor, are we, are we still seeing disease spread here largely in households? I mean, where, where, where is this? We're, we're seeing, uh, we haven't seen. Well, I'll start with this, but as you heard, I mean, I was just amazed at how good the track and trace has been here in Danbury. And we found, we found the household. You found where there were a number of infections in a multi-generational household. And you were talking about the heat map where you could almost walk it down the street. And you saw with connections before we um, you know, got people identified how that would spread down a street. And by the way, it sort of reminds me of what we saw uh, going back in March and April and May, where it maybe started down the very southern part of the state, including Danbury here. And then you saw it marching right down the I-95 Metro North uh, corridor. This is the same thing on an urban basis. So are a majority of the, the cases we're seeing being transmitted between members of the same household? I think yes is the answer to that. And how does that, how does that affect your thinking about reopening schools and the, and the increased risk? I know we talked about it a little bit yesterday, about especially with kids going back and forth between daycare and school. Uh, I think uh, for K through five education in particular, the fact that they can be in a classroom cohorted just with themselves rather than going 
you know, from the home to the playground to the daycare, maybe part-time in the classroom. I think it's the safest way to go. And I think you heard that from the daycare operators as well, loud and clear yesterday. That said, I think Danbury is a different situation. When you have a 6 or 7% infection rate, let's pause on that, and that's just what they're doing. Can the mayor elaborate on what will be the metric you will use to decide whether or not they will, when to bring students back into the school building? Well, I mean, uh, just to back up one second, um, so we see so we we see spread and care. Correct me if I'm wrong. In really, three key areas, right? Travel, both international and national. Uh, two would be uh, in some of our uh, places of worship that went to live services. They've now scaled back and gone to virtual. And then three, we've seen some transmission on our athletic fields. Hence, the closing of our uh, sports leagues and et cetera. So. Those are the three key areas that we see. Now, some, somebody asked me yesterday, well, I, I don't understand. How could somebody travel internationally? Well, some people are dual citizens, and they can go back and forth pretty easily between the various countries and be able to come back in here. So you see that to be um, an issue. And most people don't fill out the form, although they're supposed to. Um, and it's really very, very hard if they're not going to participate in the program that we're doing. Um, in terms of the metric to going back to school, the superintendent will look at those things closely. In a couple of weeks, we'll look at these numbers. You know, it's, it's not really too hard to figure that out. If, if we were at two, three, zero pretty much every day, we're, you know, on Friday we had 44 new cases, yesterday 15. Um, you know, if these numbers start dropping way back down, then we know that we've got our arms around uh, the spread and we can uh, entertain going to a hybrid model and then eventually migrating into a full school. Uh, but we do know to spin up even a hybrid, it takes about three weeks for us to do that. So that's why we're, we're waiting till October to say the kids could think about going back into the classroom. And just to really clear about how this is spreading, so you're saying it's coming from travel, social workup, and athletic teams, and then spreading among families from there? That's right. Kid, uh, you know, we know, we don't know a lot about this, and I should be careful when I say this, but we think the research is showing that children have, carry a much higher viral load and that viral load is much, makes them much more contagious. Although that, though they beat their immune system, beats the virus, the, the load that they have in them uh, makes it easier to spread amongst the family members. So it sounds like this is coming from gatherings that are approved and allowed, not from unsafe gatherings? They are. I mean, you know, we've seen uh, barbecues of 10, 15 people, aunts and uncles and a couple of parents and, and cousins and kids. And, that, you know, we've seen a spread going on there. So we've asked people, the governor's asked people, I've asked people to think twice about having those kinds of events until we get over the hump, we get our arms around this and we, we understand that uh, we pretty much have pegged down where the problems are and, and we have to get more people tested too. That's another key because that helps us understand where the virus is and where it is not, right? And that's just as important. And do you feel like it's still spreading kind of exponentially in town or are you starting to get your hands around it? I think we're starting to get our hands around it. I mean, we knew last week we had about a week you get about a week window on this stuff before it, it runs out of control. And then you, then you can't do contact tracing because there's so many cases per day. It's impossible. You just don't have enough staff to do that. So um, we feel okay, um, but we want to see more numbers, more data. Hey, so are, 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 are the kids on the athletic fields, are they passing it to each other? Like are they sitting on the bench or the yeah. baseball game? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we're, this is a guesstimate. We think it's uh, really the benches and, and, and being close together. You know, I, I was at games on Tuesday night. Parents didn't have a mask on. Kids on the bench weren't wearing a mask. Nobody was social distancing. I mean, that's a problem. I mean, it just it's still there. I know people want to think and forget about it because we're so tired of this. I get it. But it's still there, and we've got to be diligent. So, Mayor, i got to ask you and the governor. So, you know, we're, we're looking at starting up all sports again. And even benches are a risk factor. Should we move more than that? Well, I, I can't speak for the governor. I, I will say this, that we pause our... Uh, uh, high school athletics for right now while we're currently under this pause. Um, I will say to you that um, uh, some of the sports that are being presented as moderate risk by the CDC, one of them being soccer, um, we've seen some spread in soccer. So, you know, baseball, right? I mean, you would think you're in le literally in left field. How can you get sick? But we, we're seeing it happen. So those are things to be careful about. Is it, uh, uh, you know, as the governor said, it's not catastrophic yet, but it's uh, something you should be concerned about and you need to watch. Do you think it's about to require the spread of between maybe soccer fields, also uh, international travel, maybe to South America? Is, would this also something, like, would this event be taken account of the county as well, because it's going to be about the importance of testing and, and contact tracing? 
Yeah, absolutely. We actually, uh, we, we're challenged here because we have 45 different languages spoken at our high school. So it's hard to get people to speak every language, but the, the big ones, Spanish and Portuguese, we have people that are, are trilingual and multilingual in those languages. And we are hiring, by the way, if anybody speaks Spanish or Portuguese, we come talk to Carol later on. But uh, we're going to continue to hire uh, contact tracers until we can get our arms around this because it, it is important to have people who speak in the same language. And if I could just say, we need people to pick up the phone. When the health department calls, you know, sometimes people are fearful of picking up the phone, but we're calling them to say, we know you're positive. Where have you been? Who have you talked to? Who should we be talking to? That's what, you know, Track and Trace is all about. Mayor Bowser, you just said that there's a lot of people who aren't filling out those travel forms. Not a lot. There's yeah. some. I want to ask yeah. the governor, is there an enforcement component to this governor? If you want people to take the travel restrictions seriously, why aren't fines being levied? I think we've levied um, seven or eight fines. Uh, we certainly levied fines for people who did not um, fill out the form. Um, so we're setting an example. Um, and I think people know that we're taking this seriously, we're taking it particularly seriously um, for people coming in from highly infected areas. I was really pleased to see that um, you know, Cuomo and Murphy in New York and New Jersey now have people at JFK and LaGuardia enforcing filling out the forms as well so we can see where people are going, see where they're traveling. Sometimes they get a uh, Uber or a car, they come to Connecticut. We want to know who they are. Now we do. Look, I think for um, especially those younger grades, um, they cohort, they stay within a group under themselves. The teacher is back a good eight, ten feet. I think that's safer than them jumping around between daycare and a lot of other facilities, as long as you're in an area that has a very low infection rate, like most of the state. And that said, uh, anything else, sir? I cannot predict what the uh, U.S. Senate is going to do. I know exactly what the House House of Representatives put a bill on the table of, what was it, 100 days ago now or something. Uh, I, I will tell you that Connecticut applied for the $300 true-up that we get from the federal government. It was approved, I think, as of last night. Now they've got to get their guidance in place so that DOL, our Department of Labor, can react. It'll probably take another two or three weeks, but we're on it. So you think that the money will fill up in people's pockets? Uh, let me let's get the guidance from the federal government first. That's sometimes well, a variable. Don't you also have to bring out your cobalt uh, programmers to uh, to deal with the legacy system? Yeah, yeah, uh, we're getting them out to the nursing homes to come and redo our uh, cobalt <laughs> system. Uh, it's an antique system, no question about it. It's not simply an uh, an Apple downgrade that you uh, upgrade that you can do electronically. Hey, that said, uh, I heard the mayor say. Uh, Please answer the phone. You better answer your phone. It might have been John Oliver on the call. <laughs> See you guys. Might be. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. What's the ribbon cutting?